<laughs> do, do what? <laughs> all right. So uh, just to make sure Caitlin at home catches all of that information, we will be testing on Thursday and we will have class this Friday because of the missed time. So, so here's what I'm, I'm th hearing from you is that you want me to work more. No, 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 she said Caitlin at home. She's already that would that would insinuate she is not present. And yes, all right. So let's see. Is that okay? The cruise six. All right. Yeah, we already did three Western European kingdoms. Yes. Yes. Okay. So the Crusades. All right. So I want to read this really long passage to you to kind of start today. Um, Beloved brethren, urged by necessity, I, Urban, which was the Pope at the time, by the permission of God, chief bishop and prelate over the whole world, have come into these parts as an ambassador with divine admonition to you, the servants of God. I hope to find you as faithful and as zealous in the servants of God as I supposed you to be. But if there is in you any deformity or crookedness contrary to God's law with divine help, I will do my best to remove it. For God has put you as stewards over his family to minister it. Happily indeed will you be if you find, uh, if he finds you faithful in your stewardship. You are called shepherds. See that you do not act as hirelings, but be true shepherds with your crooks always in your hands. Talking about like their shepherd's crook, the thing that they used to get the sheep when they get lost with the hook like Bo Peep, you know. All right. Um, do not go to sleep, but guard on all sides the flock committed to you. Now, this is an analogy to where Christ talks about the, uh, himself as the shepherd. All right. So if you have, if you attended much about the Christian faith, you know, there's the concept of sheep and how sheep kind of get lost and the idea is it's the job of the shepherd to keep those. And you kind of have to follow that analogy to follow what Urban's going to say here. Okay. Do not go to sleep, but guard on all sides with the flock committed to you. For if through your carelessness or negligence a wolf carries away one of your sheep, you will surely lose the reward laid up for you with God. And after you've been bitterly scorched with remorse of your faults, you will be fiercely overwhelmed in hell and abode in death. For according to the gospel, you are the salt of the earth. But if you fall short on your duty, how it may be asked, can it be salted? Oh, how great the need is the salting. And so just to kind of give you an introduction to the language here. Now, obviously, it is an older English. And this is a message that Pope Urban is going to deliver to a group of ministers. And he reminds them that they are the shepherds and it's their responsibility to take care of the flocks. And if they don't do that, then there is literally hell to pay. And he basically says to them, um, skipping forward in this very long message. Although as sons of God, you have promised more firmly than ever to keep the peace among you and to preserve the rights of the church, there still remains an important work to do. And here's where we come in. Freshly quickened by divine correction, you must apply the strength of your righteousness to another matter which concerns you as well as God. For you, brethren, who live in the East are in urgent need of help, and you must hasten to give them the aid which has often been promised them. For as the most of you have heard, the Turks and the Arabs have attacked them and have conquered the territories of Romania, as far as the shore of the Mediterranean and Hellespont, which is called the Arm of St. George. They have occupied more and more of the land of these Christians and have overcome many of them in seven battles. They have killed and captured many and have destroyed churches and devastated the empire. If you permit them to continue thus for a while with impurity, the faith of God, which will much more widely, uh, excuse me, with impurity, the faithful of God will be much more widely attacked by them. So in other words, there are all of these people that have been attacking their brothers in the east. It was part of that Greece, uh, that Holy Roman Empire, that Greek East Orthodox group, and they haven't done anything about it. And we've let it happen and we haven't been involved. And so he says, on this account, or rather the Lord, beseech you as Christ heralds to publish this everywhere and to persuade all people. 
or whatever rank, foot soldiers, knights, rich and poor, to carry and aid promptly to those Christians and to destroy that vile race from the lands of our friends. I say this to those who are present, and I mean it for those who are absent. Moreover, Christ commands it. All who die by the way, whether by land or sea or in the battle of the pagans, shall have immediate remission of sins. So if you die in this holy war, you go into heaven. This I grant them by the power of God which I am invested. Oh, what a disgrace if such despised the base race which worship demons, should conquer a people which has the faith of omnipotent God, is made glorious with the name of Christ. So if we let these people who worship demons conquer our people, then we should be ashamed. With what reproach will the Lord overwhelm us if you do not aid those who with us profess the Christian religion? So if you don't help them, what's going to happen to you? Let those who have been unaccustomed unjustly to wage private warfare against the faithful now go against the infidels and end with victory. This war which should have begun long ago, let those who for a long time have now been robbers now become knights. And so basically, this is a call from Pope Urban that it is time to go and to fight. Now, it's a very long sermon, pretty much. And what Pope Urban is asking them is he's asking them at this meeting at Claremont. Now, remember, keep in mind, this isn't just an everyday church service. This is, it's kind of like a minister's convention, if you will. This is a special meeting just for ministers. So this is a special event. This wasn't something that happened all the time. And the Pope decides, Pope Urban II, that he is going to make this his key mission, that these guys are going to go out and that they are going to round up these people that are attacking the infidels, as he calls them, and they are going to come in and take this land back. And so that is his goal here, all right? So the crowd's response to this speech, the year of the speech is 1095. 1095, the Pope says it's time to take back the Holy Land. They respond to him with this chant. It is the will of God. It is the will of God. Now, again, the speech was a response, as we said. This is an appeal from Byzantine troops to assist them against the Muslims. And what makes these two religions so contradictory is that they are both kind of have the same start, same foundational start. And if you go back, and we've talked about this before, to the foundations of the Quran and the foundations of the Bible, both come out of the same area. And both come from kind of the same story of Abraham. And so it's one of those things that the one group believes, and of course this would be Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, really. Um, you have Islam. And you, well, not all people of Islam, to be fair, but you have uh, people, Muslim people who have taken the Holy Land. And then you have the Byzantines who were fighting against them. And so these two groups are in conflict. Now, why does the Crusades, why do the Crusades matter? There's a few reasons. Uh, for one thing, if you've ever wondered why the relationships were so bad, particularly between these two groups, between your, if you, if, if you know much about the Middle East, you know that it is not exactly, except for like Israel, a pro-America place, right? It's not exactly American friendly. Uh, Americans as a nation, the United States, Americans as a people, are associated frequently with Christianity. Now, we know that every person who walks through America is extremist. Fanaticism. Religious fanaticism. So think about this with me. Um, and you may not can relate to this as well because you you did not really live through September 11th and some of the things that were connected with that. But one of the things that is a comfort... Um, 
that is always brought up like with the extreme Muslim groups is that they call anyone who is not a believer in their faith an infidel. And we're talking about extremists. Your average everyday Muslim person is no longer a is no more a member of Al Qaeda or Jihad or anything else than you know the same as like most of your Christian churches don't handle snakes. You know these are things that are looking at specific sects, right? And so what you see here though is these these people become fanaticized. Why? Because they are told go take this land. You have God's blessing. If you go do it and if you die, it's okay. Now, with September 11th, one of the things with religious religious fanaticism that was proliferated and uh, was that these leaders of this attack were told that there was extreme reward for them for what they were doing. And so, you know, you see this idea where where you promise people extreme things, and because of that, you can get them to do extreme actions. All right, so. Some other things it's going to do that are significant, it disrupts trade. So the trade relationships that have been built, those are going to fall apart too. And so all of this kind of connects together because it is going to build problems and tensions. So let's talk about the four reasons. The four reasons. So reason number one, the Pope hoped to reunite the entire Eastern Mediterranean. He wants to reunite the church. You know, you've got this split with the Greek Orthodox, and he wants to put it back together. And, I mean, I get that, you know. I get him wanting to reunite the group, get the band back together. Reason two. Some of these Italian city-states that they're looking at uh, that have large navies are hoping for commercial gains. Large yes, it's, Italy has some large navies. Hoping for commercial gains. Yes. Why? Because if they can get things worked out, possibly. Possibly, they can make money out of this. I mean, it all comes down to what's in it for me, right? And so there's the hope. Maybe if we do this, we can get this. To add to this, the Byzantine Empire was in decline. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't throw up my road sign there, did I? Well, kind of, yes, yes, that's number three. The Byzantine Empire's in decline. Why does that matter? They're not Byzantines. Well, here's the deal. So you have the Middle East, and then you have the Catholic um, West. The Byzantines have been the buffer. And if that part goes away, you know, it's kind of one of those things that sometimes there are people that you can love from a distance a lot easier than you love up close. Some personalities that you know you can respect that person and be like yeah they're they're fine but you don't really like to work with that person or if you do like you know maybe you can do it through email easier than like that face to face just fun stuff right I imagine Chris there are some people that you like a buffer with yeah you get this all right so but when that's gone then you got a deal right you got a deal reason number four They're, the group that is controlling the area, particularly Turkey, are the Seljuk Turks. Wait, can you repeat that? Turkey is con being controlled by the Seljuk Turks. And they're declining. Yeah. All right? The Seljuk Turks, are they like, they're the Ottoman, right? Mm -hmm. um, exactly. As I know. It's okay, going to no, I, I was going to say, when you do, let me know. Yeah. Okay, so um, the, the Byzantines were being declined because the Turkish was taking over, right? Yes. Um, so, like. Well, it had declined. Okay. 
Yes, it had declined because the Turks had taken over, but the Turks aren't very strong. And they're also spread out. And remember, when you get spread too thin, right, you're not doing anything all that well. And so, yes, they have taken over, but it makes them easy to conquer. Good question. Yeah. And I was, I was, um, so they, they, right now, what you're talking about, they're taking over Constantinople. Right? Yes, they have taken over Constantinople. They're kind of struggling because they're spread out too thin. And so even though they've taken over those places, we can take them is the idea here. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they've had good success in the past. It's like it's like if you're going to play a team in any sport and you're like, oh, they were awesome two years ago. Well, some things have changed. It's kind of the same thing. Good question. And I may not have made that clear. I never mind you asking. All right. So they no longer, although this group is there, they're no longer able to um, ensure the, the Turks, let me backtrack a little bit. The Turks were there. All of the, the Muslim people they're talking about aren't necessarily these Turks. These Turks were Muslim. They had turned it into Constantinople, but they're like playing nice. Okay? So they can get along with them. But they're declining, and so they can't really protect those the Christians who come through there anymore. Let me make that makes a little more sense to say it like that. They can't, they're they're there. They're not as much the enemy. They're not our friend, but they're not our enemy kind of the idea of the Catholics here. And so, or maybe they are our friend because they are protecting us from our enemy, but it's it's a frenemy relationship, if that helps any. Now, by 1097, the speech was given in 1095. Yes, by 1097, 30,000 knights, mostly French and German, had gathered Ready to conquer the infidels. Get them. Um, 30,000. Now, I this was something I, I learned a couple of years ago watching something. I just found it kind of interesting. Uh, we know they're trying to secure the Holy Land, right? The Holy Land is important to them and to their faith. Something I did not know is how expensive armor was. It's silver, right? Well, it's sometimes it really depends on how how they've some it's smelted, and so sometimes it will have silver, sometimes it will have brass. And it depends on the armor they want. Now, this was something that I found interesting, and I made a note of it. Their armor was worth three years' wages. And I think about you know I like clothes, I like to shop. Probably would more if I didn't start you know got a bills sometimes <laughs> but just think but i can't imagine spending three years wages oh, on like something i mean that bet that would be like well you know i mean if you're like and i even kind of i don't know i almost get bitter at celebrities who they're like this dress cost them three hundred and something thousand dollars and i'm like you know i would hope at that point in life i'd be like okay look I'm going to go buy Christmas for families, you know, and, and still get a nice dress, but it doesn't, you know. And again, that's easy to say, you know, a lot of times those are donated or whatever. And so don't send me hate mail about your favorite celebrity and their dress and that they do good things for people. That's great. But. I mean, you know, you want quality armor. I get that. But it's expensive. This stuff is expensive. How many of you have ever watched uh, A Knight's Tale? Okay, so apparently you don't watch movies. That's okay. You don't watch good movies. So there is a movie that you really need to see. Uh, all right, so let's try this so I can feel old again. How many of you know who Heath Ledger is? Okay, so like three of us. This was like early Heath Ledger. This was the second movie I really saw him in that I knew who he was. The first was in The Patriot. He was the oldest son in the movie The Patriot, which if you also haven't seen is really good. I think I showed part of that in English. Um, but A Knight's Tale is just fantastic. And it's about where he becomes a knight at this one point And he goes in, they win. Uh, you have to watch it. But he, his, the guy he works for, that he's the squire for, dies. And they need the money. And so basically they dress him up as the knight. is kind of the playoff of it. But they talk about even like his armor gets damaged. And it's so expensive to fix it. Because you had to find somebody who was a blacksmith. That's why if you wanted to be balling in the medieval kingdom, you were the blacksmith. That was the job to have. So two really good films that I would strongly suggest to you since you know, I want to improve your taste in movies. 
uh, would be the Patriot. It's bloody and gory, and there's a lot of violence that happens with an axe. So some of you, that's going to get you ready to go. And then a Knight's Tale, there's a lot of jousting. And yeah. Yes, yes. The, yeah, the Joker was his last film before he died. Definitely totally different role, and he is he is totally hot in both of those movies. Like, he kind of goes downhill for the Joker, for sure, but that was like young Heath Ledger, and yeah, those were good years for him. So, all right. So anyway, um, yeah. All right, so they're preceded by, they tried this little peasant's crusade before. It was a lot of land-hungry peasants who were like, we're going to journey east, and that did not work out too well. They mostly died. And so these guys don't just want to go to the Holy Land. It sounds great to go and, like, liberate the Holy Land. But here's the thing. We all know in war, to the victor goes the... Winners? Spoils. Spoils. There we go. That means anything they find when they're out there fighting for God and king, they get to keep. All right? Now, it doesn't work that way anymore if you... Our soldier, right? You don't get to just go up and be like, you nah. know, oh, we will take this home. There was a pretty good movie about the Iraq, was it We Three Kings, the Iraqi war movie? It was about these guys who found like all this gold. It was fiction, but they were like sneaking it home. They were soldiers. And it wasn't true, but anyway, it's a good film. All right. Again, trying to expose you to some good films. All right. So the Crusades early on. So at first, they're met with a lot of success. At first, things are going well. So they get to flaunting all over. And this shows you how many crusades there are. There's a first, a second, a third, a fourth. We're going to kind of condense a little bit. So first, things are going good. They took advantage of the political weakness in the area. And there was a lot of uh, problems with the Abbasid rulers. Remember, we talked about the Abbasid. That should sound kind of familiar to you. And so there were schisms. What is a schism? Mm. Do you want to have a schism? No, you don't. Schism sounds bad. A schism between or parties caused by differences in opinion or belief. It's a split. There was a split. No, a quarrel. There we go. Take that s off that front. Spelled differently, but still, I was like a squirrel. I call it squirreling when people like randomly jump topics. So, but yeah, it's a quarrel. That's right. He meant quarrel, and he said squirrel. So yeah, that's fine. Guys, see, I don't have altercations. All right. How can you say altercations when you're not in a quarrel? Or saltercations. We don't have saltercations. All right. So anyway, moving along. Because of that, they had had some problems. So the Seljuk Turks had expanded in 1037, and then they had replaced the older order of Baghdad. So the people who were in control of Iran, they had kind of been replaced by the Seljuk Turks. Flash forward... With that group, they're all aligned to different families. And so you can see where that's going to cause problems, right? Family drama is a whole nother level of drama. It really is. Uh, the Seljuk Turks. That's one of the things that's hurting them. And so what you have is the major families in the kingdom are starting to kind of pick sides here. It's the Monte Montesquieu's and the Capulets, basically. All right. So let's talk about this first crusade. So we said it did it begin officially on Tuesday, November 27th, 1095, in a French city. And so you see here, it began in 1095 on a Tuesday. And that was when Pope Urban had preached. Now, as we said, Urban had preached. Now, as we said, he outlined a basic strategy that everybody is going to go a year later. Well, it's about nine months. And you would be responsible for self-financing. It's in the Army. They're not going to pay your way. There's no ROTC scholarship. 
for the Crusades here. And everybody's own job. Not only will you pay your way, but you're responsible for making it to the Byzantine capital. We're all going to meet up there and we're going to fight. So it's like, who's with me? All right, break. See you in 10 months. Mm -hmm. Now, in retrospect, there might be some problems with this theory, right? But we've all got to make it to Constantinople and then we're going to rendezvous there. Let's do it. Yeah. Now, the idea was then they would they would sync up with the Byzantine emperor and they would take out those Seljuks. They've got it. They got it figuring out what in the world. Okay, I'm gonna have to do it that way. All right. So uh, once again, this region was kind of interesting. And so, you know, remember they're taking on the Muslims in Syria and Palestine, and the ultimate goal is to make it to Jerusalem. So let's talk about the crusading armies. So in broad outline, the First Crusade is going to basically conform to the Pope's scheme. The recruitment is vigorous. There are major promises, and there are five major armies that are built. They're all built of noblemen. Ultimately, this group is going to make it, and they are going to assemble together. The majority, as we said, are French and German. However... What the Pope had not expected was that uh, it was going to be extremely popular amongst the townspeople and the peasants. He expected more the nobility to show up. And so these common people are going to show up. The largest and most important army is going to be led by a, a poor preacher by the name of Peter the Hermit. Peter the Hermit. That sounds like the guy you want to follow, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, why why did he just expected he, that wasn't the group he thought would be targeted because normally the peasants work the land and the nobles' job were to answer to the king and to fight for the king. Oh. And remember, if you fought, then you were rewarded with land. And so that's who he expected was going to answer the call. But he has all these peasants show up. And he's, he's cool with that. It just wasn't the way he saw it going down. If that makes sense. Okay. All right. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, they were, no doubt. All right. Now, although there were a large number of people who participated, to be fair, only a very small fraction of them ever successfully reached the Middle East. For one thing, when we say, when we talk about these peasants, I in no way mean anything that we're going to say critical, so please don't misunderstand this. Most of them never travel more than 10 miles away from where they are born. For one, they probably don't have wagons. If they do, they're limited. If they had animals on which you could ride, those were reserved for using on the farm, right? And so you made everything you needed or bartered with like local people who would travel around and, you know, everything was close together. And so you probably would never travel more than 10 miles in your entire life. A 10 mile circle would be like the ultimate radius. And so for these people, many of them within two or three days, they are further than they would have ever been in their entire life. And so no wonder they don't make it to the Middle East. They have no idea where they're going. You know, now granted the world was very, very different then, but can you imagine if you had to strike out on foot, take away all those highways and everything else and, you know, that's a long way. It's a very long way. Oh, no doubt. All right. Uh, even fewer, so very few actually make it to the Middle East, even fewer to survive to see the ultimate triumph of the crusade at Jerusalem. Um, a little bit about Peter the Hermit again. He was a French priest. He was an eloquent preacher of the first crusade. And to be fair, he sent thousands of peasants marching against the Turks who were massacred in Asia Minor. So he basically sends these untrained, unequipped people to mass against, to march against the Turks who are pretty much going to slaughter them because they are armed. So sounds good in theory. Peter himself, though, managed to escape, and he accompanied many of the other crusaders to Jerusalem. So why do people follow Peter? Well, there was this story that is reputed, which means it's never been proven. 
that he visited the Holy Land in 1093. And when Pope, when uh, the Pope proclaimed this crusade, Peter began preaching around France, all around France, telling people that they needed to follow and do this. And many of them were inspired because they'd never been inspired to do anything in their lives. You know, maybe, I mean, we've been exposed to a lot more, obviously, but maybe somebody's told you about something before and they get you excited enough that you do something or go somewhere or look at something that otherwise you really wouldn't just have any interest in. But it's because of their enthusiasm that you're like, well, you know, maybe it's important. And that's kind of what happens here. On August 6th, the Crusaders advanced to Izmir, Turkey. Is there a T sign? Izmir, Turkey. The problem is, though, Peter has no capability uh, to maintain discipline with them to have them prepared to um, what to do. He has no way to teach them discipline. Uh, and so there he gains a title for the Christian army in the spring of 1099. So, I mean, this guy kind of goes full circle, doesn't he? He quits, he comes back, he is captured, and then eventually he makes it to the ultimate goal, which is Jerusalem. Lastly, shortly before, they're going to storm Jerusalem to try to take it from the Muslim people. He preaches a sermon on one of the most famous places in Christendom, which is the Mount of Olives. And then they storm Jerusalem in um, July. Now, after this happens, he returns to Europe in 1100. And he founds his own monastery. Of course, the fact he was this big figure in the crusade kind of gives him some clout and people are going to join him. Now, What's the difference between a monastery and a regular? Okay, so you ha uh, a monastery is a home for monks. Yeah. Uh, yes. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. He returns to Europe in 1100. And so, very unsuccessful, does not go very well, but eventually he does have this beautiful moment where he is able to kind of lead to the end of this in Jerusalem. And so what happens in Jerusalem is a very bloody campaign. Um, it is going to actually be taken to kind of backtrack just a tad, July 15th. And they were under the instruction to kill everyone in Jerusalem. They massacred virtually every inhabitant. When they attacked. This was before he makes it back home. The attack of Jerusalem. They massacred virtually every person there. They claimed they were purifying the city by washing it with the blood of the defeated infidels. A week later, the army elected one of its leaders, Godfrey of Bullion, to rule the new city of Jerusalem. That's a nice headpiece. Yeah, it is really. It looks like if you took like fruit and put it in a wreath. <laughs> I'm guessing it's from the same root word as bullion, which is bullion. If you talk about bullion, it's something that's used to make meat. So maybe his family raised cows, or, uh, or maybe that's that's where a certain breed of cows came from. Uh, but bullion is a when I think of bullion, I think of a type of um, you guys know what bullion cubes are, right? That's oh, what I think. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yes. You use them to make broth, basically. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a, that's what it makes me think of as a bullion cube. Yeah. You said broth, and I'm thinking boobies. Yeah. All right. Uh, so basically, he is going to be left to control here. This is when Peter the Hermit goes back. He starts his monastery. Everybody's happy. So after the first crusade, this was the most successful crusade for the Europeans. Why? Because they had taken Jerusalem. It was the key city. However, that is not going to last. Jerusalem was the Latin kingdom of the medieval Christian state. 
it was compromised of what is now Israel. Um, what was Jerusalem then also, and this is just a side note, today is in part of Jordan and part of Lebanon. And so the kingdom that they called Jerusalem was bigger than just the city of Jerusalem. They have control of Israel, Jordan, and Lebanon. It's really huge. All right. This, as we said, was established in 1099. It's going to last until 1291. So these attacks last and are successful for, uh, it holds the area, area for about 200 years, close to it. 1290. Uh, 1291. So almost 200 years. Now, in Jerusalem, they adopted a feudal system. The French nobleman Godfrey of Bullion did. And so his new title, if you're just curious, because I think it's a pretty awesome title, he was dubbed the uh, he was dubbed to govern the kingdom as Baron and Defender of the Holy Speckler. Sounds pretty important, right? Like the stationery had to be awesome. Baron and Defender of the Holy, Holy Speckler. Speckler. All right. So after him, the secession is not is going to be elected. They're going to pick who is going to do this. It is not going to be hereditary. And we're seeing more and more of that, aren't we? In our last few lectures, when we see people secede in different areas, it is less and less based on who your daddy was. Well, I mean, it's still based on who your daddy was, but just because your daddy was that doesn't mean you're going to be. So Godfrey is going to die in 1100. So he did not have that position very long. He had it one year. And his brother... Baldwin I is going to take the title and call himself king. And Baldwin rules until um, 1118. And although this is not supposed to be hereditary, he is seceded by his cousin, Baldwin II. And Baldwin II is followed by his son-in-law, Fulk V. And then eventually, this you see this continues until this family basically has control. So let's talk a little bit about Fulk. It was it was Baldwin, Baldwin the second, and then you have Fulk. Or I'm sorry, um, Godfrey, Baldwin, Baldwin the second, and Fulk. Fulk's full name was Fulk. Oh my cord! I was like, what you spell? Fulk the Young. I don't know if he had like a dad who was folk the old, but you know, at some point. But at any rate. So, under folk, this kingdom reached its highest point. So he's the best. Uh, they also have not only the kingdom of Jerusalem, but most of Syria as well. However, problems are about to start. 1187, Muslim forces. Try to reconquer Jerusalem. 1187, Muslim forces try to reconquer Jerusalem. 1228, the Crusaders regain the Holy City under Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II. Uh, 1228, he was crowned king of Jerusalem the following year. Uh, they regained the city in 1228 under the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II, who's also known as Frederick the Great. 1244, the Muslims retake Jerusalem. And so we see this is going to go, and so we see this is going to go back and forth. So why, why does it go back and forth so much, but they were so successful in the end. Well, to make it pretty simple, um, because when they first fight, they are not, it is a united group of Christian uh, crusaders against a non-united group of Muslims who are defending. And so just because in 1095, Pope Urban said it's time to ride, that doesn't mean people know that that's happening in the East, right? Communication isn't what it is today. And so a lot of them are not aware, are prepared for this attack. So, basically, this will eventually, the, the second crusade was that response in 1145. That response in 1145, which we, we just mentioned. 
And that is basically going to attack numerous people again, same reasons. Lots of Germans are going to be killed. And once again, they take Jerusalem. And so you see this cycle. All of the Crusades have the same cycle where they are constantly being um, going back and forth and back and forth. Then you have a third crusade. Um, the failure of the second crusade is going to, as you can imagine, the Muslims fail. And so, just like in any other group, they decide to regroup. And when they do, you begin to have a same issue in 1187, as we already talked about. And eventually, that leads to the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick I. Now, Frederick I, also known as Frederick I Barbarossa, called on his friend Philip II, and that's how they were so involved. Now, one thing that's interesting is Frederick I is going to be killed in those crusades. Uh, well, in he's killed in this time period, but it's interesting how he dies. He does not die fighting. He does not die on the battlefield. He dies while bathing. Yeah. I, if I remember correctly, it was an accidental thing, but he died while bathing. Yeah. So, anyway, how many of you have ever heard of Richard the Lionhearted? Maybe if you've watched Robin Hood in the Robin Hood movies. He is actually in the Third Crusade, and he is a friend of Frederick's before Frederick dies. So finally, in those later crusades, we really don't see a lot of success either. The most successful was the first one. Why is this important? Because a few key reasons. Why are all of these crusades so significant? One, it ruins those relationships. Two, it hurts trade, but at the same time, it establishes markets. Why? Because these people who travel with those crusades are going to come back wanting for other things. And the last but not least reason that the Crusades are important is that it is going to lead to a lot of the changes in the church because as relics and different things come back, what begins to take place is money changes hands. And so if you know much, the Reformation is coming not long after this because corruption is going to be more on the forefront. As the church, every time they would have these new crusades and these new buildings, uh, some of the religious leaders and their zealousness, we will call it that, would offer forgiveness for sins and other things of the like if you would buy indulgences. Remember learning about indulgences? And so the crusades are going to give way to a lot of these things that become very controversial about the church. And so we see this very dark age where this is supposed to be this religious movement. This very dark side is going to come out of it as and I wonder as the um, as we move into this period. So some things I want you to take away from this. This is Louis. He's leading the second one. This is Gregory. Uh, there you have Frederick, Philip, and Richard. who are going to lead that third just one. Just sitting there. All right. <laughs> now, the main thing to take away, like I said from this, is just how when these events take place and when you see this kind of sense of extremism of let's go kill everybody in the area and, you know, totally wipe out with blood, there are going to be consequences. And so that is where we are going to leave that for today. You always got to leave it on I know. I like cliffhangers. I know. It's better than cliff falls. <laughs>